Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. More than one year ago I made a video about the famous Inca or pre-Inca stone walls of Peru and I presented the hypothesis that the reason they are made from irregular blocks of stone yet interlock so perfectly is because they are made from stacking cement bags. Although I've presented the idea, many viewers have pointed out a number of problems with this hypothesis and I have to admit that geologically this idea doesn't work as the rocks have been analysed and the quarries have been located. So I have since been searching for an alternative explanation and I believe I have found a researcher who does have the answer. Thanks to a subscriber who sent me a link, I have read a paper by Helmut Tribusch for the SDRP Journal for Earth Sciences and Environmental Studies that was published back in December 2017, titled On the Reddish Glittery Mud the Inca Used for Perfecting Their Stone Masonry. And wow, I think he may have solved this age old conundrum. In this video I will quote his paper and present Helmut's ideas but I strongly urge you to download the paper by clicking the link in the description below. Since its discovery by the Spanish conquerors, the masonry of the Inca buildings have left most archaeologists, earth scientists and independent researchers truly baffled. With stone blocks, frequently megalithic in nature, fitted together in such an exact and perfect manner so that often a razor blade cannot be inserted into the joint. It is without doubt one of the most amazing accomplishments of human construction and it certainly deserves our attention, especially as iron tools were apparently not known to the culture that is supposedly responsible for them, the Inca. I and many others have long believed that the stone structures are the work of a lost ancient civilization, because nobody has yet come up with a logical explanation of just how the Inca could have built them. Yet radiocarbon dates from organic material found beneath the structures, as well as archaeological finds associated with them, all give a date within the Inca timeline. It is generally accepted by researchers associated with Peruvian history that there is no secret formula to the construction of these stone walls, and they were simply created with primitive stone tools for hammering and fine sand for polishing. The builders were just incredibly patient and meticulous. But I don't buy this. Look at this site. Look at the size of the overall structures as well as some of the size of some of the individual blocks, and then just look at how perfectly they have been put together. Were these really done just a few hundred years ago by the Inca civilization with stone tools? Before we can hypothesize about the age of these structures, we first need to work out how they were built in the first place, and I think that Helmut Tribouche has finally done it. As the author says, the quality of the Inca masonry is highly varied, and many structures have been crudely patched up at a later date. But the most important monuments are those that are made with perfectly jointed stone of different shapes and sizes. The stones are polygonal and often have convex pillow like faces and sunken joints. Some believe that the Inca builders enjoyed the effect of this irregularity and the play of light and shadow on the walls. But there is also no doubt that such intricate stonework would have also been earthquake resistant. Inca walls are also typically inclined inward by 3 to 5 degrees, and this is no accident as it makes them more stable in the earthquake rich area of South America. Also, building in this manner means that every single stone in a structure has its preferred position. In an earthquake, the walls do become destabilized because of the vibration and they dance around accordingly. But when the movement stops, stones in such a structure find their original place again because gravity favours their position with perfectly matched interfaces. This of course does not happen with regular brick structures as the vibrational damage becomes permanent. This style of stone building is also not unique to Peru, it is also used by the Egyptians as seen on the casing stones of the Giza pyramid of Menkore, and it is also seen in ancient Greece. But in this video we are going to look at the interlocking stone structures of South America. 
The softest stone used in these structures is limestone, which, as the author states, is applied for the foundations of the saxe Horman fortress, but not for the impressive facades which are made of andesite, an igneous rock quarried 35 kilometers away. In fact, the commonality in the rocks used in these interlocking stone structures is the fact that they are all made of hard igneous rocks that contain quartz, feldspars and other minerals. The composition of the stone structures of Peru are not widely known, but Trebuche explains this in detail. Andesite is one such volcanic rock, and it is also found in the walls at Cusco and Rakchai. Diorite, which is magmatic in origin, is also frequently used. This is compositionally the same as andesite, but has larger crystals as it formed at a slower rate. Granite, which is also composed mainly of quartz and feldspar, as well as its fine-grained equivalent, rhyolite, are found at Machu Picchu and Alantitambo respectively. What we learn from studying the rock types of the walls in ancient Peru is that they are igneous in nature, and whether andesite, diorite, granite or rhyolite, their composition is characterised by having a high quartz and feldspar content. These are known as silicate minerals due to their high silica content. It is these rock types and their composition that is key to understanding how these stone walls were built, but there are more observations that first need to be considered. First of all, generally, when you look at the stone walls in cross-section, only the front or visible section of such a wall show the perfect fitting. Where the wall is load-bearing though, most of the rock interfaces are well fitted. Many joints are only well fitted to a depth of a few centimetres, and the leftover space is filled with smaller stones. As Trebuche points out, on the rear side of such walls, the fitting is not perfect and is often accompanied by filling material. So, in most cases of such walls, the perfect joints are observed on the outer faces so that they look beautiful from the outside. It was often simply a finish. Almost always on the bottom surfaces, where a stone sits directly on another, the joint is also perfect, like the imprint of the entire irregular bottom face of the upper stone can be seen on the upper face of the stone below. It is almost like the lower stone acted like plasticine. Deep inside the wall though, the joints between rocks on the left, right, front and back are far from perfect, but the joints above and below are. However, there are places where the perfect fitting does extend into the inside of the wall, and in some cases it continues all the way through to the opposite side, such as at Saxahoman and the Sacred Plaza in Machu Picchu. So just how did they do this? How did the ancient people of Peru make a perfect imprint of the bottom of the stone above onto the top of the stone below? Trebuche takes a look at the writings of early chroniclers and cites Garcilaso de la Vega, who wrote in 1609, and Caesar de Leon, who wrote in 1553, as two of the best sources of information. Garcilaso had a Spanish father, but his mother was an Inca princess, niece of the Inca ruler Huina Capac. He had a good education and mixed with influential Incas before emigrating to Spain at age 20. There he wrote his Inca history. Caesar de Leon was a Spanish conquistador with a modest education, but has proved to be quite a reliable chronicler in terms of the accuracy of his writings. Both confirm what mainstream researchers say, that the Inca used harder stone tools to chip and grind stones into shape. The Jesuit priest Barnaby Cobo reports seeing the Inca using tools made from extremely sharp volcanic glass known as obsidian, and this was used to dress stones. He also says that the size of the construction teams that were employed to cut and grind the stones were huge. So there was an element of brute force, as well as a high volume of workers, to prepare building projects. Garcilaso de la Vega mentions the perfectly fitted stone walls, and although they looked to have no space for mortar, he says that mortar was applied into the construction. He says it was made from a reddish sticky clay known as Ilancac Alpa, which they made into a paste. They used it to fill up gashes and pits caused in working the stones. Caesar de Leon writes that in some buildings of Alantitambo, molten gold was found instead of mortar in a certain area of the royal palace, and together with applied bitumen, ensured the stones remained fitted together. 
Garcilaso also states that in many of the royal palaces and temples of the sun, they poured in molten lead, silver and gold for mortar. When explaining the Inca masonry, when Caesar de Leon talks about a bitumen substance, Trebuche believes he is clearly defining a combustible material. So, in summary, both chroniclers confirm that a mortar or bitumen was used and it is described as a reddish and sticky clay and it was also combustible. In other instances, gold and silver were poured into the joints. But strangely, nothing remained visible in the joint between the stone blocks and Garcilaso de la Vega even says that no trace of mortar remained between the stones after it was applied. This is therefore quite the conundrum. As the brilliant Brian Forster has shown in many of his videos, many of the Inca stone walls display a glazed appearance, particularly at stone junctions, but sometimes across the entire stone surface. This can only suggest a special surface treatment. It is seen in the city of Cusco, Alantitambo, Machu Picchu and many more. As shown in Helmut Trebuchet's paper, here we see part of a wall some 4 metres high at Alantitambo's Sun Temple. Here only the joints are highly reflective and they appear to be vitrified, whilst the rest of the structure looks to be simply hammered. There was obviously special treatment with regards to the joints. Many of these surfaces also refract and diffract light, and due to the vitrification the surfaces are also smoother to the touch. It is therefore a clear scientific fact that there is partial and selective chemical treatment of stone joints and surfaces. As Trebuche explains, natural humic acid slowly weathers silica minerals in rocks such as rhyolite and granite. Certain acids like tartaric acid dissolve silicate minerals 10 times faster than other acids. So, as the Inca structures are all made from silica-rich rocks, which we detailed earlier, did the builders have access to a highly acidic liquid, mud or paste, to artificially accelerate the weathering of the rocks to fit them together? The answer is yes. During their mining activities, Inca miners would have certainly learned to know about what is known as acid mine water, which comes from mines rich in sulphide minerals such as iron pyrite, also known as fool's gold. As Trebuche states, acid mine water is an unavoidable problem of environmental pollution in sulphide containing mines and it severely damages stone and wooden equipment in mines and there is evidence of historic sulphide mining in the Inca territory. Mining in this region goes back two to 3,000 years as the Incas and pre-Inca civilizations mined gold, silver, copper and tin. These mines were associated with sulphide deposits and the workers must therefore have been familiar with acid mine water and its corrosive effects on rocks. Certain types of bacteria that are present in mine environments are responsible for activating the chemical reactions. They gain their energy from the oxidation of sulphide minerals such as pyrite. I won't go into detail about the chemical reactions that take place as this is detailed in the fantastic scientific paper, linked below in the description but the whole process results in an acid substance, sometimes a solution but it can also be in the form of a paste or a mud. Basically, it is a byproduct of the bacteria's reaction with the pyrite minerals. The Incas would therefore have certainly learned how to transform metal sulphide particles into a reddish acidic mud and would be all too familiar with how it affects silica-rich rocks from their extensive mining activity. The red acid mud would have been a common sight for the Inca miners. With a pH as low as 0.5, it is approximately 10,000 times more acidic than the natural humic acid that is known to slowly degrade the rocks used to build the Inca structures, turning the silica-rich minerals they contain into kaolin and clay. This all ties in with what the historic chroniclers said about the reddish mud being used by the Incas in their construction projects, and Helmut Trebuche puts forward the case that this acidic paste was used to soften the edges and faces of the rocks, to mould them into tightly fitting walls, as well as the substance made of dissolved silicates being pushed into the tiny gaps between the stones as we can see here. But there's more. 
Trebuche records the old Peruvian legend written down by priest George Lira that states that the Inca stonemasons used a herb or plant to soften rocks. The legend may actually have a hint of truth, because if you add organic matter to the acidic red clay substance from the mines, it actually aids in the silicate minerals dissolution, as scientifically proven by Bennett and Casey in their 1994 paper titled Chemistry and Mechanisms of Low Temperature Dissolution of Silicates by Organic Acids. The substance was already a low enough pH to dissolve the silicate minerals, but the organic material would further accelerate this. Again, the details of the science can be read in the paper. The historian Cesar de Leon did mention that the Inca used bitumen to fit stones together, which of course is a combustible material. He also said that molten gold was used with it. Real gold has never been found inside the joints of the Inca stone walls, and Tribouche therefore makes the fair assumption that he mistook gold for fool's gold, the iron sulphide mineral pyrite. But for Caesar de Leon's bitumen to be the acidic red clay, it assumes that heat was involved. Pyrite, when finely grained, is subject to self-heating when in the right conditions, temperatures, and when mixed in the right substance. For example, heating the clay substance with additional crushed pyrite by 100 degrees can generate a temperature of 330 degrees within the substance. The stone builders of the Inca could have added extra crushed pyrite from the red clay from the mines and heated the substance to accelerate the chemical reactions and to mould the rocks faster. Self-oxidation would be the result and it would have produced very hot sulfuric acid very easily. So, to summarise, Tribuche thinks that the acid mud, and possibly with the extra crushed pyrite and organic matter, is likely to have been placed between two building stones, and the weight of the upper stone would have gradually levelled the unevenness. The dissolved silicate particles would be redistributed before recrystallisation, creating the tight fit that we see. This would have modelled the shape of the weight-bearing stone onto the lower one. As you can see, only the tops of the stones in the wall look to be unevenly shaped, and that is simply due to the weight of the stones above thanks to the acidic substance. The dissolved silicate particles could even be applied to the small holes and gaps, and that is why we see seemingly small, multi-faced, perfectly cut stones inside walls of larger blocks because the dissolved silicate substance was inserted into the hole like a paste and allowed to cool and recrystallize. Once the stones moulded into one another, they would have been treated and finished with tools. A similar but slightly different strategy would have been applied for the vertical interfaces between the stone blocks. To add further credence to this theory, scientific tests on the vitrified jointed areas of the rocks have shown traces of iron and sulphur, just as we would expect to see due to the makeup of the mineral pyrite. The author of the paper admits there is more work to be done, but as somebody who has looked into the Inca stone walls a great deal, this theory for me is without doubt the most compelling one I've ever come across. Surprisingly, it is one that doesn't require ancient high technology, and it also doesn't imply a lost ancient civilization. The only mysteries remaining are the protrusions or nodes that we see so often, and also how such large stones were brought into position. But maybe these also have straightforward explanations, and I'll be discussing this further in future videos. Next month I am launching a second YouTube channel called Space and Planet, which will focus on Earth and space science news as well as independent scientific research. Please subscribe now to give my channel a head start and I'll begin making videos next month. You can find the link in the description below. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.